Welcome everybody to Church Chats. It's a podcast where we discuss faith, life, and church with our friends. And today is our first podcast, and it's with our good friend Thomas Williams. Hey, Thomas. Hey, Glenn. So glad that you're here with us and glad to be here. Joining thanks, us for the first for podcast. Me. Yeah. It's uh, Thomas is the director of music and worship arts at First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth, and you've been right. here how long? Just over two years. Two years. Just over two yeah, years. Feels yeah. Good, right? yeah. It feels yeah. great. Your hair always looks so nice, Thomas. It's always, always it's, so... It's, is it too high today? Is it? Is no, it, it, I mean, it looks great. You know, the higher the hair, the closer to God, right? So uh, I've heard that. That's, that's a Southern thing. Yeah. That is true. Well, I was always told to make sure you look your best. And so that's, you know, if it's either at church or it's at life, you know. What's your... How often are you getting these haircuts? Uh, every two, two weeks, twice a month, give or take. Nice. When I worked in my first church, the pastor always had perfect hair, and he got his hair cut every week, though. Every single week. It was week. a little little much for me, but, Oof, yeah. you know, with short hair, my hair goes fast. I have good genes, and so <laughs> it just, it's how it works. So. <laughs> it's got good genes. It's got well, good genes. You know, I told you I found a barber downtown, right? You did. Yeah. I, you did. I, I need to get on your schedule of, like, every two but, weeks. Well, I mean, all it takes is making it a priority. I guess so. I guess so. So, um... <laughs> Anyways, Thomas and I, how long, how long have we known each other, Thomas? Uh, since 2010. I moved to Texas in 2010, okay, and um, you were the first, one of the first people I met when I came to yeah, Texas. Yeah, that's right. You so. were the youth director at Cleburne, so. That's right. Those were fun times, and yeah, Thomas was there, came in, came in from Arkansas. Uh, yeah, and grew, Arkansas. Grew up, um, grew up in Arkansas, went to college in Arkansas. Yeah. Um, tell me about... Tell me about that growing up in Arkansas and your your upbringing. And you know, Thomas is Baptist, so it's and we love we love our Baptist brothers and sisters. But the key word is was Baptist. Was That's Baptist. the was Baptist. Okay. Uh, yeah, grew up in Arkansas, small town, um, uh, about six thousand people. Graduated with like one hundred and seventy five in my class. So for Texas, that's very small, of course. I, I was here the huge 400 mm-hmm. people in their in their school uh, when they graduate. And so I think I, think I graduated with like eight or 900. Oh, you know? good it's night. <laughs> I cannot imagine how small you would feel. Well, being ev- in. Everybody asks all the time, oh, do you know so-and-so? You went to this high school. I'm <laughs> like, no. no. <laughs> I didn't know anybody. But I'm sure with 170. So 175, I knew every single yeah. person, that's for sure. But yeah, I grew up in Arkansas and uh, went to school at U of A, uh, worked in some churches up there, and then... Got to the point, uh, grew up Baptist, like I said earlier, and then went to school, but there wasn't, you know, the Baptist churches there were uh, more contemporary, mm-hmm. and, you know, I just wasn't a contemporary person. And uh, they didn't have handbells. Mm. And the one church that had handbells uh, was a ladies only handbell choir, and okay. they would not allow me to ring. So Even with the high hair? Even with the I high was... hair, they would not allow me to ring. And so I went to a Methodist church that had some friends who were singing at right across the street. Uh, right across basically the other end from the U of A and uh, loved it, loved the liturgy, loved the the structure of the service and um, Mm -hmm. a year later after attending I ended up joining and so I've been a United Methodist for over 20 years. So, and I've loved it. So that's longer than you were Baptist. Correct, longer than I've been Baptist. So even though everyone loves to bring it up, I've been a (laughs) a United Methodist longer than I've been a Baptist. Gotcha, okay. Well, I I don't, I I sometimes ask like giving you a hard time. Everyone does, that's okay. You're not the only no, one. I, so. I get it. I get it. Um, well, one of, one of the wonderful things about Thomas um, that I love so much is is his love and care for traditional music and uh, in in the church context. And so, uh, tell us a little bit about your journey uh, through music uh, in in Arkansas, as well as uh, once you moved to Texas, and kind of how how your your faith journey has morphed uh, with with that time. Sure. Sure. Um, well, first of all, being young and a traditional music person is not mm-hmm. very common. Right. So I remember when I was at school and I worked as an assistant director at a church in Fayetteville. And, um, you know, I was assistant director teaching handbells, uh, doing some stuff with the choir uh, whenever the director was out. And, you know, I was looking for jobs. And so trying to find, like, I wanted to be a director. But all the jobs, they wanted you to do some contemporary stuff. And I'm like, oh, I don't do contemporary stuff. That's not my thing. It's not my jam. Um, and so I just kind of stayed an assistant director at a few other churches for about 10 years. And I just kept having doors closed because I didn't do contemporary. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did serve a, lo- a short time at a new church startup where I had to l- start a band 
and uh, lead them, I led it on piano, and that was during the time where a lot of the music was piano driven mm -hmm. uh, in the 2000s. Uh, Michael I'll, W. Smith. Michael stuff. W. Yeah, Smith, right. and uh, you know, some of the Chris Tomlin stuff uh, was kind of have that piano was very important. Now it's more uh, electric guitar driven, if you would. Uh, and so I got some experience, but still never felt like that was, I was good at it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I love playing. I've been, since then, I've played several years uh, in a contemporary service in my last church. And I fill in here, mm -hmm. um, so I do that quite regularly. But, um, you know, what I had to realize at some point that when I was serving in the church, that it was no longer about me mm -hmm. and my preferences. Before, I used to be like, I'm serious about traditional <laughs> organ, piano, handbells, you know, maybe orchestra at Christmas and stuff. That's perfect. I uh, always have to have a choir. But, um, you know, the, the idea of the contemporary service was, you know, oh, they, that's not real worship. That's just right. people who want to be entertained. Uh, and I started to really, you know, talk to, have, to people and have friends who grew up with that and that they, you know, they, they were still worshiping and still had a real connection to God when they were doing it. So... I had to start putting aside my my personal biases and my personal like education from like you know classical music is the best mm -hmm. uh, and realize that you know people worship this way and it's a valid form of worship mm -hmm. and you know who who am I to judge someone to worship that way and so that was a really turning point for me in my ministry uh, where I started thinking more about you know God first and through Christ and not so much about me and yeah. so that's kind of how it really evolved and. To be honest, it took probably you know almost ten years when I from starting to you know I was my late twenties yeah. uh, when I started to realize that and you know it's, it's been beneficial for me ever since. It's it's funny you say that because I was I was the flip flop of that. Um, mm -hmm. I started I was a drummer in the youth praise band in junior high. Um, I was like I don't want to go to the sanctuary. <laughs> and, I mean, there's no I mean nothing it, for you there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the the church I grew up in. Uh, the youth were in the basement. It's like we were relegated to the base. It was a cool spot. We were relegated to this basement. Sure. And so we got to be as loud as we wanted. Electric guitar, drums and drums, the teen angst. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but then uh, I, I actually came to this church first, Fort Worth, uh, in early high school. And I met my wife here yeah. who was singing in Mark Burroughs choir uh, in the youth choir. And then all of a sudden, I'm really into choir. Yeah, choir and traditional music. And well, that's what I, mean, I think Mark would even tell you that a lot of people say that you know, uh, a lot of guys got in youth choir because of a girl that they actually liked. <laughs> right, so, yeah, I think, you know, they're like, yeah. oh, I'm, I think I think I might try youth choir out because there's this girl who's really pretty. And so yeah, it's you know, I was not that way. I was always, you know, I was the nerd in youth choir that you know, everyone just thought, oh, there's Thomas. He goes to church all the time. You know, and. So, but a lot of cool guys who, like you who are drummers. The cool, yeah. yeah you should cool, see me the, in the cool, Yeah, the cool drummer, guitar players, not the Eagle Scout. You know, he's <laughs> not cool, so for sure. I still th I think you're pretty cool. Maybe if, if we would have met back then, maybe we'd have been friends. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. It's possible. You never know. I don't know. Um, so tell me about, so you mentioned uh, Thomas is the one who's always at church and everything. Was yeah. that something really that was that your parents instilled in you or that just your church home that you were just yeah. always going to go to church I mean that was always I mean growing up in the 90s uh, in a small town there wasn't much going on there mm -hmm. wasn't sports there wasn't I mean stores weren't open then on, on a Sunday right. after 12 you know uh, and so we if the doors were open at church we I was always there it, I can even remember when I was grounded that I was still allowed to go to church, though. Like, I couldn't right. do anything else, but you know what? You can still go to youth choir. You can still go to youth group. Um, so I still was able to go on Wednesday nights, to, which is still kind of like fun. We played games and stuff. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, they always really instilled for me to go to church. Um, you know, I don't come from a family of ministers of any sorts. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents were coaches uh, mm -hmm. and then principals and, and counselors, school counselor. And so, but they always felt that, you know, for me, being in church was probably... Probably not the you know, worst thing for me to be, even when I was grounded. So I always grew up in church. And so when I went to college, like I mentioned, I just thought, i got to find a church to go to. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm no longer at my parents. So obviously they can't tell me where to go. Um, but So I looked at different churches uh, on my own. 
not because I was working or anything. I just somewhere to attend. That's what you do at church on a Sunday. You don't sleep in. Right. Come on, you don't sleep in. <laughs> that was uh, that was actually my punishment. My parents. I mean, we were. Your punishment was to go to church? No, my punishment was that I couldn't. Like, oh, okay. You didn't get to go to church because <laughs> I, I was I was one of those kids who I we always as youth ministers uh, we we used to call them the vomit kids, which sounds really gross. I, I know, it, but we called them the vomit kids because we said if we told everybody we're going to have a vomit party at oh, church. Oh, okay. The kids would still show up, like they yeah. were just always there. So you were you were a vomit kid. You were just I, there every single Sunday. I, I, I w- wouldn't use that word, but sure. I was a <laughs> devout follower of Christ. Therefore, I was there to be. I wouldn't say, but yes, I even you know, and so much that I was not happy with my Sunday school class when I was a youth. Uh, I went to a fifty-five co-ed Sunday school class. <laughs> Whoa! Uh, how was that? It was good. Side note, it was led by my girlfriend's grandfather. So I okay. kind of, sure. I was already playing the system okay. of like, hey, you know, <laughs> my girlfriend's grandfather is this Sunday school class uh-huh. teacher. Yep. I don't really care about talking about sports and, you know, um, true love weights kind of stuff that we used to talk about every Sunday. Like, okay, oh, we gosh, got it. We yeah. got it. Uh, so I went to that Sunday school class and we just studied about the Bible and just, you know, verse for verse and one point. And one points with the granddad. And points with the granddad. You have to. You have to, to. yeah. Um, A couple couple years ago, was it four or five years ago, you made a decision to go back to school. I did, yes. What what prompted that? It was a couple years before COVID. Uh, I graduated just right December, right before COVID. Yeah. um, So when I moved to Texas, my plans originally were, with my degree in music from University of Arkansas, Obviously, I, I learned the music side of it, mm-hmm. and I thought, well, yes, I've been a devout follower. Yes, I've you know been to Bible studies and stuff like that. I feel like um, I, I should probably be a bit more versed in you know the history of worship and you know and theology to to serve in the church. Not everybody ha- feels that way, and I know you don't necessarily have to have that to do that in music. Mm-hmm. But I felt it was very important. So when I moved to Texas, I thought, well. There's all these seminaries in Texas, SMU and, you know, Bride, and then there's Southwestern, DBU, and I know there's some other smaller ones that have, you know, seminary programs and, and you know, and music. And I originally thought that I might do music at there or maybe just get like, you know, seminary training of, of like a uh, master's in theology. So not like an right. MDiv or anything, but just like get the Bible basic knowledge and then so I can serve music through that. And... Obviously, when you start working, it gets harder and harder mm-hmm. to, to, to make time to go to school. And when you're working full time, it's just like, oh, it, it just you keep pushing it off. That's why everyone says um, when you go to your master's, don't go to work. Some right. people say, just keep, yeah, just keep going because yeah, yeah. once you start working, it makes it really hard. Yep. And I'll agree it did. Um, but I got to a point in my career that uh, I was able to uh, ask my pastor. I was like, you know, I really feel... Uh, led to do that and uh, you know by that time I had taught Disciple One a few Bible studies that are not music related. Uh, I used to help with confirmation Mm -hmm. uh, teaching some music sections there and some like Wesley and you know history sections in there and so I just felt you know what I prayed about it um, on a whim Uh, not on the the prayer wasn't on a whim on a whim I said you know what I looked around I saw that Southwestern was only about 20 minutes from from Alito Methodist where I was serving at the time and I thought, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to apply. I'm just going to apply. And it was late in the semester. It was like, like, so spring semester started. I think I applied like in December. Yeah. Okay. So like they're already, uh, <laughs> pretty much already accepted people and, you know, have those who are enrolled are going to be enrolled. Felt I said, like you know it might what? have been a long shot. Yeah. yeah so I'm just going to, I'm just going to enroll. Actually, I think I might have enrolled in January, to be honest. Like after Christmas, after New Year, like New Year, New Me, mm-hmm. um, I think I decided to, to, to do that. And, I remember like sending all the stuff in, typing the you know reasons why, and getting the references, and it was like a week before classes are supposed to start. I had not heard anything, and so I thought, well, maybe, oh, maybe, oh, maybe I'm not going to do this. Maybe it's maybe I waited too, you know, too late or whatever. Um, then I got an email saying you've been accepted. Uh, and I thought, okay, great. And so I uh, I emailed the music school there, and they're like, well, we've already had 
like placement auditions and stuff like that. So I'm um, like, we're, 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 we're waiting on, you know, the, the, the main seminary to send in your approval mm -hmm. stuff. And I'm like, okay. So I just went up there. I was like, you know what? My mom always used to say, don't email, don't call, just go over there and they can't say no. And just so hand them your resume. Just hand there, them your resume. So that's what I did. So I went up there and I was like, hey, I've registered. And I talked to one of the, the main uh, registering deans. Uh, and I was like, hey, he's like, well, you missed all this stuff. He's like, well, and I told him I worked at the, you know, a Methodist church and all kind of my history. And go, oh, oh, you're Yeah, it's this. funny. I'll tell you a story. I, I might <laughs> tell you what he said after when I graduated. So. <laughs> He didn't think I was going to do it, actually. And I said, well, he said, we can take congregational song. You don't need any prerequisites for that. So I, I, said, I rolled into that. And he asked me, how's your theory? I said, well, it's not great. It's been a long time since I've had it, th over 10 years since I've had a theory class. He's like, well, let's put you in the theory class. And then we'll put you in choir. We'll put you in the, like, the my master chorale. And it was on Monday night. So I said, I want a part time. So that's like two main classes plus, you know, a, a night class just to, just to try it out. Yeah. And Love, obviously, congregational song is very important to me. That's hymns and the, the history of the all singing in, in church. And so from then, I just kind of just really felt this is where I was meant to be and, you know, continued through the process uh, of conducting my master's in conducting there and uh, learned a lot of, got a lot of seminary mm -hmm. classes with New Testament, Old Testament, as well as history of worship and philosophy of music ministry and things that really helped serve in the church sure. for me. And I ended up graduating in 2019 of December. And of course, like I mentioned earlier, three months later, it was COVID. Yeah. So kind of everything shut down. So then I was like, sure. all right, I have all this knowledge. I, <laughs> now I can't really use it very much in music. The pews so, are all empty. Like, oh, the pews are all empty. Yeah. No one's singing, oh, you know. And gosh, so, but yeah, yeah I, I still am um, grateful for that education and the knowledge from that. Oh, the singing. You remember like in the, in, at the height of COVID, just how, I remember in the gathering, we would wear masks and sing through the masks. Yeah. Plus we had plexiglass, like what, yeah. a, what a crazy time. Yeah, and, and so I was on the other side. So I really, um, I did not have my choir singing at all really during that time because I felt that for me to be the one who was singing, uh, and even though it was online, mm -hmm. um, I, I just, I didn't like the idea of having to pick and choose what choir members would sing because, of course, people are going to get their feelings hurt. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and then the idea that it was really about uh, a lot of music directors got this performance um, focus. They were like, okay, sure. we have to do all this editing and it has to sound great. So I want to get my best singers to make this to try to say, you know what? Yeah, church is still happening like it always has happened. Mm -hmm which obviously it, that's not true and it changed for, for a lot of people and still has changed for a lot of churches mm -hmm. now, that I, I just told my choir, I asked them, I said, do you guys want to do this? And they were like, no. I said, do you guys want me to send you know, you a microphone and have to do the recording and mm -hmm. we have to mix it? And they were like, no, we don't want to do that. We'll just wait. So I really used that as a time to have a lament uh, for, my, for our singers and, and we were ready to join together. Because again, part of singing in the congregation mm -hmm. And in the choir is doing it together. Yeah, absolutely. Not, no one wants to sing yeah. from home. No one wants right. to watch an online service really and sing. I mean, some some might. Some, sure. I, I don't want to yeah. discount that. Some might, but it's just different when you're in a room with a group singing together. Um, it, it's part of being a part of the body. And I think you know, as Christians, that's what we're we're called to do. We're not called to walk in our faith alone. We're called to walk with others. Yeah. And same with singing. It's it's, yeah. it's a it's a thing. It's a body thing. So well, yeah, it's a core core part of especially traditional worship and yeah. and you know the Wesleyan singing. Yeah, rules absolutely. Are, you know, absolutely. just always you know lifting our voices up yeah. as one. Um, yeah. Well, I think this is a good stopping point for uh, part one of our chat with Thomas Williams here. Uh, we're we'll be back with part two in just a little bit, and we're gonna jump into some more talk about music and worship and planning side of it sure. and just the, the whole differences that we might experience at a contemporary service versus a traditional service. So join us in part two. We'll see you in a bit.